And thank you, Diana. And you know what? The body of Christ is beautiful. And uh, I'm glad to be a part of this local body of Christ right here. I don't know about you, but I, uh, I love being a part of this body. And, uh, and one other person was glad with me, so that's good. And uh, aren't you glad to be a part of the body of Christ? Yeah. Amen. And a great, great church body that we have here. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, turn with me, if you would, to Mark, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, in a moment we'll begin reading with verse 1, but I want to tell you about the, the couple of uh, boys who on the outskirts of town there was this big, big old pecan tree by the cemetery fence. And one day the boys filled up a bucket full of nuts and, and they sat down by the tree out of sight and they began dividing the nuts. Several of the nuts were dropped on the ground and rolled down toward the fence. While they were dividing the nuts, they were saying, one for you, one for me. One for you, one for me. Well, another little boy came riding along the road on his bicycle and he, he passed and he thought he heard voices from inside the cemetery. And he slowed down by the tree, or he slowed down a, a, to investigate, and sure enough, he heard, one for you, one for me. One for you, one for me. And he just knew what it was. Oh my, he shuddered. It's Satan and St. Peter dividing the souls at the cemetery. He jumped back on his bike and he rode off. Just around the bend, he met an old man with a cane that was hobbling along. Come here, quick, said the boy. You won't believe what I heard. Satan and St. Peter are down at the cemetery dividing up the souls. The man said, beat it, kid. Can't you see it's hard for me to walk? But the boy insisted, and so the man hobbled to the cemetery. And standing by the fence, they heard, one for you, one for me, one for you, one for me. The old man whispered, boy, you've been telling the truth. Let's see if we can see the devil himself. So shaken with fear, they peered through the fence, yet they were still unable to see anything. The old man and the boy, they gripped the wrought iron bars of the fence tighter and tighter as they tried to get a glimpse of Satan. At last they heard, one for you, one for me, and one last one for you, that's all. Now let's go get those nuts by the fence and we'll be done. <laughs> well, I want you to know that demons really are no joke. There really are demons. And as we look at this passage today, we're going to examine Jesus' remarkable power over demons. You may recall, if you were here last week, that last week Jesus said to the disciples, let us go over to the other side, speaking of the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And you recall, probably, if you weren't too asleep uh, during this time last week, that they went through a storm. And uh, there was this, this terrible storm uh, that they went through uh, as they went across the Sea of Galilee. And now, after they they experiencing another type of storm, after they experienced the meteorological storm, now they are going to experience another storm, and it's a storm that's raging inside of a disturbed man. Let's read about it today. We're going to pick up with the first verse of the fifth chapter. We're going to read through the... 20th verse, so it's quite a bit of reading, so let's get to it. And it says, And they came over unto the other side of the sea, unto the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains." 
because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces. Neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. And cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send him away out of the country. Now there were there, nigh unto the mountains, a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about two thousand, and were choked in the sea. And they that fed the swine fled, and told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that was done. And they came to Jesus, and see him that was possessed with the devil, and had the legion setting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And they that saw it told them how it befell him that was possessed with the devil, and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coast. And when he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit, Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord has done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed, and began to publish in Decapolis, how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. Jesus and the disciples had left the western side of the Sea of Galilee. They'd gone out into the Sea of Galilee, and this terrible storm had come up, and and, uh, Jesus calmed the storm, and then they land on the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee. And we know where this place, where this was, because there's really only one place on the on the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee where a where there is a cliff and a steep incline where these uh, swine could have could have ran and and jumped in the in the into the water. Now this may be one of the most remarkable of all of Jesus' miracles. I like talking about this miracle. I tell people, and I talk about this miracle, that this is the first uh, recorded uh, evidence that we have of deviled ham. If you think that's bad, it's getting ready to get worse. Not only do we find that, but we find that these, this demon went out of this man into the pigs and they ran down the side of the hill and did a perfect swine dive right into the Sea of Galilee. I guess you could say that they committed suicide. Okay, that's enough. I won't do any more of that. I don't know if you believe in devils or demons but I want you to know Jesus did Jesus believed in them and he encountered them often as he walked upon this earth C.S. Lewis wrote a fascinating book about demons entitled The Screwtape Letters It's a fictional account 
of the letters that were written by a chief demon named Screwtape to his nephew demon Wormwood. Wormwood has been assigned to a man in England to keep him from accepting Christ. Over Screwtape's objection, the man marries a Christian woman and converts to Christ. The book ends with the patient going to war and dying in battle. And then goes to heaven. Wormwood is a failure. So he's recalled to hell where screw tape consumes him in the fire, which is Satan's desire for everyone. Complete destruction. Now the book is fictional. But don't miss the point. The point that Satan and demons are real. In the preface to the book, C.S. Lewis wrote these words. He said, There are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialistic or a magician with the same delight. There, are a lot of conf- there is a lot of confusion about the devil. There's a lot of confusion in our world about demons. And so since we're looking at this passage of Scripture today, I want to share with you four truths about this subject of demons. As we look at Jesus' remarkable power over demons, I want to just share with you four things, and then if that's not enough, you might want to come back tonight because we're going to be talking about starting a a study on battle stations, and I'm going to be talking to you tonight about knowing your enemy. And so we'll be talking tonight about about Satan too, and then we'll get off of that subject and get on something good. But uh, we're going to talk today about four truths about Jesus' power over demons. The first thing that I want you to know today as we think about this is that demons are fallen angels who carry out the strategy of Satan. That's all demons are. They are fallen angels who their one job, their one thing that they want to do, their main purpose in life is to carry out the strategy of Satan. Now sometimes, sometimes we deify Satan. Sometimes we look at Satan and we try to put him on the same level as God is. We, we're kinda, we kind of have a Star Wars uh, way of looking at things. You know, that, that the Satan, he's, he's on one side of the force and, you know, he's, uh, he's simply battling against a, a, an equal uh, force. And, and so that's the way that we look at it. But folks, I want you to know, that is not true. Satan is only a fallen angel created by God, but wanted to to ascend. And so he has fallen. But I want you to understand that he does have an organized and a demonized army who are going about trying to carry out his strategy, which his strategy is to kill, steal, and destroy. That's what Satan wants to do. Satan wants to destroy you. He wants to to take you straight to hell. He doesn't want any of us to succeed. If he can't keep you and send you to hell, he wants to keep you from having a close relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants to tell you, you're no good. You're no good, baby, you're no good. Wait, I said I wasn't going to do that anymore, did I? If you want to know about Lucifer's fall, it's found in Isaiah chapter 14. But let me just tell you who Lucifer was. Lucifer was a shining angel who he had this, this high ambition. 
His ambition was to ascend above the throne of God. He loved himself. He said, I will ascend above the throne of God. He tried to be like God, but God kicked him out of heaven. And when God kicked him out, others joined him. Now something else you need to know about him. Satan is a fallen angel, but he still has access to the throne of God to accuse you and to accuse me. If you go back to the book of Job, you remember one day Satan was walking before God and God said, have you considered my servant Job? He serves me. And you remember Satan says, no, well, the only reason he does it is because you bless him. If you took away all the blessings from him, he would curse you to your face. And God gave him permission to take away all that Job had. And yet Job never did curse God. Well, Revelation tells us that Lucifer and his angels are going to be cast down further and further. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, it says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. I'm telling you, he's going down down, down. He wanted to go up, but he's going, going down. Now you may wonder, you may be sitting there today wondering, well, why doesn't God just do away with the devil? I mean, God's more powerful than Satan, right? Why can't he just do away with him? Why can't he just, let me tell you something, God has a plan. Because it says in Matthew 25, 41, that he's going to Put all of them. It says, Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye are cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. God's got a plan. And his plan is to save you. His plan is for you to have a relationship with him. Let me tell you something. Hell was not created for human habitation. Hell was created for the devil. But the devil knows one day he's going to be there for all eternity. And he wants to take as many people as he can with him. And so that's what he's striving to do. Now, let me share with you the second thing. The term demon possession isn't found in the original language of the New Testament. The question always comes up, can a Christian be demon possessed? Can a Christian be demon possessed? Possessed. Well, if you were to study the word possession in the original language, in the Greek, you will find that it is an invention of the translators. When they, when they translated from the original Greek and translated into English, they had to find a way to use the word and something that we would understand. And so they used the word Demon possessed. But the Greek word is the word dama azume, which means demonized. Demonized. Friends, let me tell you something. Every one of us, including believers, is the target of some kind of demonic influence. 
Did you know that? You are the target. Every one of us has some kind of demonic influence on our lives. Do you believe that? Dr. Ray Stedman, he wrote about it. He said, the New Testament never actually uses the term demon possession. It is a term which has been invented, but it may not be very accurate. The word in Scripture is always demonized, whether it means possession or control or influence. This is the word which is used. We have read into it the idea of demon possession, but I do not think it wise to use it because it is not used in Scripture. It is evident there are various stages and degrees to which demons, evil spirits, can affect or control human beings. So my friend, let me just say this to you today. Don't waste your time trying to distinguish whether you can be demon-possessed or not instead of think in the terms of how much demonic control you are under. And that brings us to the third truth. The third truth that I want you to look at. What are some signs of destructive demonic control. What are some signs? Some people that will tell you that all sickness, all disease, all mental illness is produced by the devil. I want you to notice that Jesus made a distinction. Because it says that he healed some people and he cast out demons. There are some people that say if you're sick, you, it's because of sin. It's because you, you're influenced by the devil. Jesus made a distinction. It says that he healed people and he cast out demons. It is a mistake, my friend, to see a demon behind every illness. In our scripture, this man who seemed to be possessed by a devil, there are several symptoms that are mentioned. It's not all the symptoms. But I want you to look at four because we see these symptoms today as well in people who are influenced by demons. Number one, the first thing that you see in this man is sexual perversion. Sexual perversion. Luke tells us, if you were to turn over to Luke chapter 8 verse 27 in his account, of this same story, Luke tells us that this man ran around naked. Let me just read it to you. And when he went forth to land, the man met him out of the city, a certain man which had devils a long time and wear no clothes, neither abode in any house but in the tombs. So here was this man that we would call demon-possessed, I guess, demon-influenced, had legions of demons. And so he's running around in this, in this place where the tombs are without any clothes on. He would be what we would term today an exhibitionist. Friends, I don't know if you know this or not, but our society is saturated with sex. There's not a television program that I know of that you can turn on and you're not going to get some little innuendo in about sex. I've even seen it on Fox News, for those of you who are Fox News lovers. There's not much you can do today that it's not there. Today, people are identified by their sexual behavior.
I want to give you some statistics. Did you know that 12% of the websites are pornography? 12% of all, however many websites there are in, in the world, 12% of them are pornography. Did you know that 40 million Americans view porn at least once a month online? Did you know that one out of three of those 40 million are women? Did you know that 70% of those that are 18 to 24 visit every single month? Did you know that the average age that a child sees porn is 11 years old? Doesn't that break your heart? Pornography is a $4.9 billion revenue a year. Folks, listen, we are saturated. We are saturated with sexual addiction, with deviant behavior, with pornography, and those are some of the deadliest tools that Satan has. Let me state this clearly, as clearly as I can. Sex is a wonderful thing. But it should only be within the bonds of a marriage of a man and a woman, period. Over in Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 4, it says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Listen, Satan wants to take what is normal. And he wants to pervert it. And that is exactly what he's doing with sex. Not only was there sexual perversion, but the second thing we find in this, in this man is that he had an obsession with death. Look over at Mark 5.3 with me. It says he had his dwelling among the tombs. And no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Here was a man who felt more at home in the tombs than he did with living people. And so he had made that his home out there. Listen, sometimes a morbid obsession with death and dying can be evidence of demonic control. You know, there's some people who believe that they can t contact the dead. There's some people who have gotten mixed up with, with all kinds of things, Ouija boards and all of those things, thinking that they can talk to people that have died. Let me just say this to you. That is an invitation to allow demons to control your thoughts. Don't mess with that stuff. Here's the third thing that we find in this man. He had a violent behavior. Violent behavior. That's a third sign. If you look in Mark 5, 4, it says, Because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, and neither could any man tame him. Let me ask you a question. What makes people shoot innocent people? What makes people go into movie theaters and start shooting? What makes them go into schools or workplaces? and start shooting. I know what you want to say. You want to say, well, they're just crazy. Let me tell you something. That's too easy to say that they're crazy. There's more to it. 
that I'm just being crazy. I'll tell you what the problem is. The problem is that they are, have demon are influencing their actions. Jesus said in John 8, 44, You're of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Let me tell you, Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He wants to destroy everything that you're about. He wants to steal everything that you love. He wants to steal your family. And if he could, he would want to kill you. Now here's the fourth thing that we find out about this man. The evil that he had was sexual perversion, obsession with death, violent behavior. But the fourth thing, self-abuse. Self-abuse. Notice Mark 5, 6. Or 5, 5. It says he cut himself with stones. I'm telling you, if you don't know, there is an epidemic among teenagers today and young adults. ABC News says that one in 12 teenagers or young adults have cut or burned themselves. One in 12. Well, this man was a cutter. That's what it says he did. He cut himself with the stones. And you may be sitting there wondering, well, why in the world would anybody do that to themselves? They say that the reason they do is because they have so much pain inside. And they can't find the source to that pain inside. And they say that when they cut themselves, at least now, they know what the source of their pain is. Did you know that four times more females than males cut and burn themselves? But did you know that four times more males than females commit suicide? But friends, I want you to be aware of something. Death does not end it all. The Bible says it is appointed unto man wants to die and after that the judgment. I'm telling you, you may think about it. You may even try it, but death is not going to end your life. It may end this earthly life, but it won't end your eternal life. Did you know that the reason the pigs committed suicide is because they had no, no moral restraint? That's why the man didn't. He already would have. But he still had some moral restraint. But I want you to know that Satan would like to control you so that you would do the same thing. Satan would like to control you until you did the same thing that these swine did. Same thing this man did. He would like to control you. Well, that leads us to our fourth thing and our last thing. Jesus can deliver you from demonic control. Jesus said that he came to give life and to give it to you abundantly. He said he wants you to live to the fullest. You may think today, well, there's no hope. Everything's bad in my life. But I want you to notice 
the change that was made in this man. If you've got your Bibles open to Mark 5, I want you to look at verse 15. And they came, come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion setting and clothed in his right mind. And they were afraid. They saw him clothed. Here was a man who had walked around naked. Now there's a difference in his life. I want you to understand, this man took three steps for help that you ought to take too. First of all, you need to run to Jesus and cry out to him in desperation. This man that has been demon-controlled sees Jesus coming with his disciples in the boat and he runs down the hill to meet him because he wants, he's at the point where he is desperate. He got to the point of total desperation. The POTD. Let me tell you something. Jesus is your only hope. The second thing that he did was he was willing, and you've got to be willing, to identify your demons. Friends, I'm telling you today, it's not enough just to simply acknowledge who Jesus is. You must trust him with all your heart. The man identified his demons. Jesus asked him who they were, and he said, Legion. There's 6,000 soldiers in a legion. So this man's saying, I have many demons. Let me tell you something. Before you can be healed, you've got to admit your condition. And the third thing that he did that you need to do is tell people about the difference that Jesus has made in your life. I don't know if you noticed it when we read it a while ago, but when Jesus got back into the boat, the man came down and says, you know what, I want to go with you. I want to follow you. I want to be a disciple. But you look at verse 19 and 20. So how be it Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord has done for thee, and, how, and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish it in Decapolis, how great things Jesus had done for him. And all men did marvel. Now I want you to imagine the scene. This man had a family. You imagine there was a knock on the door this day. And this guy hadn't been home in maybe years. And the wife goes to the door and she sees it's him and she says, oh no, get out of here. And he says, no, wait. I'm changed. I'm different. Can you imagine the happiness in that home? Let me tell you something. Your testimony could help someone else come to Jesus. Well, as I conclude, there's a question that keeps coming to my mind. Now that we've studied this story last week and this week, Jesus went to the other side. Why did he go to the other side? Why did he go through the storm to go to the other side? We don't have a record of him doing anything else there. I think the reason that he went to the other side is because he knew this demonic man would be there. And he knew he had a need. And I want you to know today, the reason you are here, and the reason Jesus is here, 
It's because you have a need. And he wants to meet it. Would you give him your life? How much demonic control are you under? Listen, every one of us deals with it. Every single one of us. Are you fighting it? Come to Jesus. Ask for his help. Come to the place of total desperation today. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word today. And Father, I pray that you'll help us deal with the demons in our lives today. Whatever it is, Father, we'll come to this altar and we'll just lay it out before you. We'll name our demons. Not to the church here, but to you. And then, Father, we'll just let you take control from there. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.